Good morning. I'm Raleigh Flynn. I'm the president of the Foreign Policy Research Institute. And this morning, we're going to be talking about Russian activities in Africa. And for those of you who are my age, you're probably thinking this is deja vu all over again. Um, I spent my formative years professionally, that is, chasing Russians in Africa in the 1980s, which was the height of the Cold War. And here we are back again, looking at Russian activities in Africa. So I, I feel very at home with this topic, even, even if my knowledge might be a bit dated. Um, this morning, our moderator is going to be um, Ambassador Ray, uh, retired ambassador. He's also a trustee um, at the Foreign Policy Research Institute, as well as the chair of our new Africa program. Uh, um, ambassador Ray served as U.S. ambassador in the Kingdom of Cambodia and the Republic of Zimbabwe, and he was the first U.S. consul general to Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam, opening our consulate general there in, in uh, 1998. Um, so before I turn the reins over to Ambassador Ray, I'd first like to do the usual obligatory housekeeping chores, which is to tell you to put your questions in the Q&A box, not the chat, put your questions in the Q&A box. The chat, if you have an issue, a uh, technical issue or something, and want to chat privately with us, you can do that, as well as we'll be putting uh, useful information in the chat, uh, such as maps and uh, other links that might be of interest on this topic. Um, uh, finally, we'll be videotaping this, so if you missed it and want to uh, watch portions of it or re-watch the whole thing again or share it with you, uh, you'll be able to do that. Uh, so, finally, I'd like to thank our FPRI members and sponsors. Uh, without your support, we couldn't bring you programs like this, so we are deeply grateful. Uh, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Ambassador Ray. Uh, thank you, President Flynn. And, and I would like to, to say, uh, like President Flynn, uh, I spent a good part of my working career dealing with, with our friends, the Russians, uh, 20 years in the Army in the 60s and 70s. Uh, I spent most of my time preparing to deal with the Soviet menace. Uh, when I became a diplomat in 1982, uh, of course, the Russians were still all over the place. I recall being the deputy chief of mission in Sierra Leone uh, in the 90s uh, after the end of the Cold War and, and having Russians all over the country. And, and again, in my final tour before retiring in 2012, having Russian neighbors at my embassy in Zimbabwe who spent more of their time trying to figure out what we were doing than they were trying to maintain relations with the, the Zimbabweans. Uh, we have a couple of outstanding panelists here today who are uniquely qualified to talk about rising Russian influence in Africa. I'm not going to go into detail. You have their bios on the announcement, uh, but we have uh, Mr. Sam Romani, who's a PhD candidate at Oxford and who's writing a book on, on Russia, Russian activities in China since 1985. And of course, FPRI's own uh, Professor Chris Miller, who is the chair of the Eurasia program uh, and who's also uh, quite expert in affairs dealing with the Russians. Uh, before we get into the, the questions, uh, I would like to uh, ask both of you if you would like to make a very brief introduction, uh, starting with you, um, Sam. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Charlie, uh, moderating the session. It's a really interesting one. And I think that if there's one point I would like to make at the start is that we tend to see in the United States and think tanks and the D.C. foreign policy establishment, Russia's return to Africa has a very sudden contemporaneous development, like something that happened as a result of the uh, systemic crisis between Russia and the West over Ukraine that began in 2014, a knee-jerk reaction to the sanctions, Basically, the U.S. has not paid attention to Africa very much, or at least insufficiently, in the later Obama years, and certainly even more so under the Trump years, and Russia is filling that vacuum. I think in this uh, well, webinar and in the book, I wanted to kind of uh, challenge that notion. I present that Russia never really left Africa. 
Athlete Union. True, there was a retrenchment in 92 when they closed a, a more than nine embassies, numerous consulates, and they uh, scaled back their diplomatic presence. But there were always globalists. There were always uh, factions within the elite establishment, starting with Yevgeny Primakov in the late 1990s and moving forward, who saw Africa as an integral, if secondary, auxiliary base in their multipolar world order. So instead of seeing the narrative as being one of 25 years of disengagement and a sudden abrupt return, which are, which are scrambling to understand, we should think of it as something that's been a lot more strategic, a lot more deliberate, and a lot more incremental. Something that's been really developing over a period of two decades. And the current pillars of the Russian economic strategy and the Russian security strategy in Africa actually developed out of discursive debates and policy decisions made during the late 1990s. So that continuity is something that I just wanted to start this day off with, and that would be an interesting thing for us to discuss later. Chris? Well, well thanks, Charlie, for chairing this session. And I'm excited to uh, have this conversation with you and, and with Sam, and, and just I'll flag for all of our viewers that Sam is really uh, the leading expert uh, today in understanding the origins of Russia's current role in Africa. And so we have a real treat to be on a panel with him and, and to hear about some of his more recent research findings. Um, you know, I, I agree with everything that, that Sam said, and I think when I, when I try to understand how does Russia think about Africa in the context of its overall foreign policy, there are two things that stand out. The, the first are local factors, uh, Russia having relations with different uh, governments, political parties, businesses uh, in Africa, uh, which are determined by uh, those relationships themselves. But then next to that, there's Russia seeing Africa as a arena for great power competition. And above all, this means uh, its relationship with the United States. And so one key question for analysts when looking at Russia in Africa is to ascertain when Russia is just focused on Africa for Africa's sake and when Russia is focused on Africa as a battleground uh, with the United States. Because to make sense of how Russia is looking at the region, you've got to understand, is this a decision about Africa or is this really a decision about the United States or another power that Russia is looking to compete with and Africa is just one of several potential spheres of competition. So I think that's one key question to put Africa in the context of Russia's broader strategy that we'll want to look at over the course of our conversation today. Thank you. I'd like to start off with, with the first question uh, and direct it first to you, Sam, uh, and then Chris, I'd like you to chime in after he finishes. You know, with Russia's rising influence or apparent rising influence in China, coinciding with China's, um, in Africa, excuse me, is coinciding with, with China's emergences as one of the dominant players on the continent. Uh, is the relationship between Russia and China cooperative or, or are there serious points of disagreement between the two? And, and do these two countries pose any kind of threat to U.S. influence and interest or should we just view them as, as separate challenges uh, that, are, that are not major? Uh, Sam? Okay, so uh, that's a great question. So I, I would say that the Russian and Chinese relationship in Africa really reflects a broader trend in the Sino-Russian relationship. And uh, since 2014, since the uh, Ukraine crisis, we've seen a market convergence of Russia and China in a variety of spheres, in the energy sphere, in the international governance sphere, particularly in multilateral institutions such as the United Nations. But we've seen that when you look at extra regional level partnerships, like in the Middle East, in Latin America, in South Asia, Africa, you see much more uh, cases of these two countries, outside of the UN at least, following their own independent parallel track agendas, occasionally not really cooperating with each other and occasionally competing with each other outright. And I think that that paradox and that paradigm of normative convergence and uh, extra regional uh, contestation is really what we see between Russia and China in Africa today. So in terms of cooperation, there's some superficial level uh, developments that have occurred. I mean, you have working groups and economic cooperation development that Russia and China have created. And last month they were talking about making, expanding them over the next decade. Some of you may have seen that. In the United Nations, Russia and China tend to vote very similarly. Like they both opposed the overthrow of Muammar Gaddafi in 2011. They both opposed sanctions against Zimbabwe. China, for example, when Russia was under scrutiny over the Wagner Group's deployments on behalf of Khalifa Haftar in Libya, 
the Chinese blocked that UN report from being published. They both worked together on the expulsion of peacekeepers in Darfur. So there's a voting pattern that comes together and there's these superficial bilateral meetings. But when it actually converts into policy, you see a lot more of the non-cooperation and contestation. So what do I mean by that? In the economic sphere, Russia and China tend to operate as asymmetric rivals in Africa. Russia tends to uh, try to step in and be the hedge partner for countries that are a bit too concerned about Chinese hegemony. So they stepped into Zimbabwe's platinum sector when the indigenization policies are facing a local backlash against China, right? Those are the policies of Mugabe. In Ethiopia too, the Russians have stepped in with debt relief as an offer because they are, they're a bit concerned about Chinese hegemony. The new the nuclear energy companies, Rosatom, are pure competitors with the Chinese. And they actually are competing for contracts in some of the same countries. So there's a lot of direct contestation there in a situation in which Russia is free riding off the Belt and Road and at times acting as a hedge or a diversification partner to it. So not cooperative. In the security sphere, Russian PMCs sometimes advance Chinese uh, agendas by proxy. Like in Libya, China is a bit wary of Turkish expansion in the Eastern Mediterranean, so Russia's support for Khalifa Haftar acts as a buttress against that. But a lot, a lot of the time, at least from some Chinese officials that, and experts that I've spoken to, and experts in the region, sometimes Russia's PMC's activities are seen as destabilizing, they're seen as reckless, they're seen as self-interested, and they disrupt the stable international order and regional order that the Bolton Road thrives upon. So China doesn't necessarily view Russia's more militaristic and aggressive posturing in terms of the use of PMCs and military interventions in Africa has something wholly positive. Even in the normative sphere, where they generally align, as I said, you see subtle differences. Even if it's just that Russia takes the lead in championing an issue in the UN, like blood diamonds in Central African Republic, allowing them into the uh, international markets, and the Chinese don't really uh, back them up or don't really follow suit. So there's this kind of independent track Thing that you're seeing in Africa, much more so than in the Middle East, where Russia and China generally tend to converge more closely. So I would say that they're both largely separate challenges in that regard. There's areas, as I note, of contestation, areas of real disagreement, in part because China thrives with its Belt and Road on a relatively stable status quo regional order, a lot more incremental, a lot more cautious in its uh, power projection strategies, whereas Russia can take the fast track, the shortcut to influence through disruption. And that's kind of how they fight, they fight each other. I don't think that China should be considered necessarily a security threat to the United States because of this, because it generally tends to keep existing regimes in power. It's, it wants to rein in counterinsurgency, counterterrorism, these type of things. But Russia could be in a limited array of contexts a security threat, particularly in the Mediterranean, if it establishes a base in Eastern Libya and Tobruk or Benghazi and uses that base to potentially pull blackmail on Europe with migration flows, or challenge the freedom of navigation of American ships passing through. So I think that Russia is more of an opportunity to be a threat, whereas China is more of a strategic competitor to American interests in Africa. Chris? Yeah, that that all accords with with how I see the, the region. And I'd add a couple of things. You know, in order to, I think, understand the differential approaches of, of China and Russia in Africa, I think it's crucial to think about what, what tools they actually have uh, to deploy. And, and as, as Sam mentioned, uh, China's got a extraordinary economic footprint all across Africa, um, now under the rubric of the Belt and Road Initiative, although it, it actually predated the announcement of Belt and Road. And, and because China has uh, economic relationships that are quite substantial with nearly every country in Africa, not only with the governments, but also in many cases with private sector actors, uh, it's able to play an economic card that's really quite powerful. Um, whereas if you look at Russia, although it has uh, business footprints in certain countries, in certain industries, in reality, it's far less substantial than what China has in terms of dollar value, in terms of breadth, in terms of uh, geographic scope. And so uh, Russia just doesn't have nearly as influential an economic card to play. What it does have, is, as Sam alluded to, is, is military options, uh, not primarily via uh, the, the, the official Russian military, but rather via uh, so-called private military contractors, which in uh, Russian usage usually aren't actually genuinely private firms. They, they um, are often uh, set up or closely aligned with the Russian security services, but have been given 
at least in certain African countries, relatively free reign um, to operate, to, uh, to deal with uh, political parties and to uh, acquire um, stakes in businesses, especially in the mining uh, sector in various countries. And this is something that Russia has used to gain influence in, in a number of different countries uh, in, in the region. And this is quite different, as Sam mentioned, than what China does. China doesn't have um, very large scale security forces in the region. And when it does, they're uh, much more tame security forces, at least for now. They're designed to secure infrastructure sites, uh, not, not supporting specific political parties or uh, being as adventurous as, as Russian, quote unquote, private military contractors are. And this, this division of, of approaches between China and Russia makes sense when you consider what cards uh, they actually have to play. But it, it does create differentials in terms of how the U.S. ought to approach them, because China presents a a long-term challenge, uh, you might argue, in Africa, just given its growing role and questions that can be asked about uh, whether the Belt and Road Initiative is is fully in the interests of African countries or, or in the U.S. interests. Russia is, is, in many cases, more destabilizing because it focuses on these military or private military contractor um, uh, uh, forces and, and lets them play um, a, a bigger role in, in some of the countries where Russia has increased its influence in recent years. And, and so that's where I, I would agree with Sam, that Russia uh, might be called more of a, a threat or at least a security challenge. And I think one of the, the, key, uh, the key takeaways from any look at Africa as a region is that um, compared to other threats that the U.S. faces, uh, Africa is definitely uh, substantially less threatening to the U.S. than, than most uh, other regions. And so when Russia deploys forces in Africa, uh, I, I'm a bit wary of describing that as a threat to the United States. It doesn't seem like it really threatens much directly, even if it is a, a threat to the countries involved, as it could be, or a challenge to, to the U.S. Uh, and its interests in the region uh, more generally. But when I think of threats that Russia poses, I, I think of its nuclear weapons far uh, far ahead of, of when I think of its, its security forces in Africa. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's been said by some that that the the last thing that we should do about the Russian quote threat in 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 Africa is to highlight it uh, because then that plays right into their hands. But but I would like to to go back to something that you you both sort of alluded to, and that is the attention that that the U.S. has paid. Uh, to Africa. Uh, the outgoing administration, for example, has largely ignored the continent. Uh, and and as, as you're well aware, uh, in terms of, of looking at strategic competitors, China heads the list for the outgoing administration across the board, and Russia quite often is minimized as, as a potential competitor in anything. How do you think uh, the new administration should should look at its policy toward these two countries in Africa in particular. Uh, let's start with you, Chris, and then, then we'll go to Sam. You're, you're muted, Chris. Right. I, I, would, um, I, I would start not by looking at actually our policy towards Russia in Africa and start by saying, what is policy in Africa? What, what are the goals we're looking to achieve? What resources are we willing to deploy and then from that assess uh, where we think Russia is playing a positive or negative role and, and address it accordingly. Um, but it seems to me that if, if Africa policy stems from Russia policy, it's going to get things backwards. And, and I would say Africa policy ought to be first in Africa and then you deal with Russia's role as a secondary matter. It, I think there's a, a risk that the US faces of trying to let Russia policy uh, seep into other geographies. We've seen this in Venezuela in recent years where Russia's played a role in Venezuela and U.S.-Venezuela policy has been, um, has been focused on Russia in a way that it never had before. And I think in Africa, there's a similar risk. And what this does is it lets Russia choose, if we buy into this, it lets Russia choose uh, the spheres in which we compete. Uh, and in reality, I think it's hard to argue that the U.S. ought to be prioritizing competition with Russia in sub-Saharan African countries or in Venezuela. These are our secondary or tertiary spheres for our relationship with Russia. They're very important in their own right, uh, but they're not, uh, they, they, ought, they shouldn't be high priorities for our relations with Russia. So if I, were, if I were devising a framework for thinking about it, I would say, one, what's my Africa policy? Two, what's my Russia policy? Uh, and then three, a subsidiary to both of those is thinking about Russia and Africa. And so what would that mean in practice? I, I think it would mean, A, it's, it's unlikely that Russia's security forces deployed uh, across the continent are 
are good for any of the countries that they're currently deployed in. Um, particularly when you look at actually how they operate on the ground, it, it doesn't seem like it's possible to argue that there's any sort of benefit that comes to this from African countries. And so I think there is an interest in pushing back against uh, their deployment and saying, A, they probably shouldn't be deployed at all, and B, if they are, they need to follow some uh, basic rules um, to, to control how they operate. I think that's a, a pretty clear priority. But then beyond that, I think we, we shouldn't try to focus our relations in Africa around uh, focusing on, on getting countries to push out the Russians. Um, again, that, 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 per, that puts too much emphasis on um, Russia in Africa. It doesn't really provide us much benefit in our relations with Russia, which are ultimately going to be decided by military and security questions and European questions, the key area of our relationship with Russia. Uh, and, and so at the end of the day, it doesn't seem like uh, it's in the interest of our Africa policy or our Russia policy to prioritize the Russia relationship, except in the specific questions like security forces where it needs to be prioritized. So that's, that's how I would think about it from the high level. Uh, um, when specific issue areas, it seems like Libya is, is problem uh, number one. Uh, and it's a problem not primarily because Russia's there, but because there's a devastating civil war that keeps spilling over into all of its neighbors, both its neighbors in Africa and its neighbors across the Mediterranean in Europe. But I think Libya is not going to be re resolved if we say our goal in Libya is to oust the Russians. Uh, the Russians don't look like they have any interest in leaving, and it would take resources that we're not willing to devote to push them out. I think if we want a Libya policy, we've got to say, what are we looking to accomplish in Libya? And how can we get the various parties involved to reach some sort of uh, negotiated solution? That won't be easy, but it'd be more productive than just saying we're primarily focused on pushing the Russians out of Libya. That Even if that were achievable, it wouldn't necessarily solve many of the problems that Libya creates. Sam? Yeah, I absolutely agree with what Chris is saying here. I don't think that you should develop a strategy towards Russia and Africa outside the context of a broader Africa-wide uh, strategy. Because if you try to chase the Russians out in Africa, you'll probably find yourself uh, deploying too many resources and spreading themselves too thin. It's not like it was during the 1990s when the Russian policy in Africa was really focused on first South Africa and then Egypt. And then as the early 2000s went along, you started seeing Algeria, Libya, Sudan, a handful of countries. Russia now has got 20 different uh, military cooperation agreements on the continent. It's uh, sending PMCs in every major region of the continent as well, from, this, uh, from Mali to uh, supporting the regime in Guinea to uh, Sudan, uh, for the Central African Republic, Libya. You're basically going to find yourselves uh, getting too involved with the overarching containment strategy. I think that the best way to kind of uh, confront uh, Russian influence in Africa is, is through several spheres. I think one way which it could be done is to take a more assertive and responsible role in diplomatic areas. Like the United States and Libya should be more foolheartedly supportive of the government international accord, and it should try to engage a European power to try to, to and, and, and powers in the Middle East to kind of squeeze Russian influence out from the diplomatic sphere. Because a lot of Russia's military intervention in Libya is to, to build up bargaining at the diplomatic table. So if the US is more assertive there, it will preempt and neutralize one of their core objectives. Another place that's pretty easy access for them could be the Grand Renaissance Dam dispute, where they can become something of a security provider in the Horn of Africa. Hopefully, with the departure of the Trump administration, some of the more erratic policies, like Trump's uh, phone call that kind of was seen to be supportive of Haftar, or his uh, implicit support for Egypt uh, bombing the Ethiopian Grand Renaissance Dam, things like that, will go away and there'll be more regularity and more stability in American diplomatic policy towards Africa. And that will provide fewer opportunities for Russia to exploit and to take advantage of. Another uh, thing that uh, the Americans should absolutely do is uh, really uh, invest more in soft power, invest more in, uh, in diplomatic engagement with the continent, show the continent that after these uh, four years and perhaps more than a decade of gradual detachment that they really care about them. And if they do something like that, that will mean that the Russian narratives that come through from the Russian state media outlets, uh, Russian political interference operations, and some of these uh, grand, grand summits, like the Sochi summit, which appealed to Soviet historical legacies and appealed to, to trying to win hearts and minds, will become neutralized. And people in Africa may be more sharply focused on the negative and pernicious aspects of Russian PMC deployments, which include supporting authoritarian regimes, or in the case of Libya, the... Uh, the, the, even the use of chemical weapons, landmines, a whole uh, bunch of issues. And finally, with Libya, 
I would say focusing too much on Russia is erroneous because Russia is an, is an important player, but it's by no means the indispensable or the core player. Khalifa Haftar's offensive is being driven very heavily by the United Arab Emirates. And the United Arab Emirates is financing the uh, Russian Biden group PMCs. Egypt is also an important player in the border area. So if we just focus on Libya by focusing on containing Russian influence and sanctioning Prigozhin, and focusing on Russia at the expense of American partners and American allies in the Middle East, which many US politicians seem to be talking about these days, you're really missing the big picture. And you might be uh, sanctioning Russia, but you're not really sanctioning the financiers and enablers of Russian conduct, which I think is also short-sighted and mistaken. One, one, one uh, final question I have before we go to, to the audience for their questions. Uh, this Wagner PMC, a very, very interesting organization. I was reading an article recently uh, that says that in the Central African Republic, they're probably as much involved in the diamond mining as they are in training the CAR military. Uh, would, would either of you like to sort of discuss how the, the Russian deployment of these mercenaries, if you will, uh, what, what is the difference between the, the economic activities they're involved in and the military activities? And, and what's the significance? Yeah, I'd be happy to talk about that. Yeah, basically, I think that Russian PMCs are very critical and important uh, linchpin of Russia's power projection. And obviously, because of their deniability, but also equally important is the fact that they've got an ambiguous set of responsibilities, and they can be proactive in a wide variety of ways. And all of these means of power projection are interconnected. So the Central African Republic, as you stated, Charlie, and in Sudan, they guard uh, mine deposits like diamonds and gold. They carry out political interference in Madagascar and also these push polling that you may have seen where they kind of artificially drum up support for Khalifa Haftar or Saif al-Islam Gaddafi in Libya. They prop up weak authoritarian regimes like Tuaderas in CAR or Bashir before that, which didn't work, but they tried to with the use of these, this force. And they carry out counterterrorism operations too. So all of these uh, in, uh, spheres of involvement, counterterrorism, autocracy promotion, political interference, and economic guardianship of economic assets are all interrelated and they're all interconnected. This is something a lot more deep than let's say China's soft security footprint, as the Chinese like to call it, is on the continent, which of course Chinese PSCs are illegally, are not even legally bound to hold guns or weapons and they're really restricted towards guardianship. So Russians can print sets of responsibilities in a hybrid manner, whereas the Chinese can really only carry out one. So that's a significant advantage that the Russians have. I think in the long term, though, the Russians will have to be very careful and judicious about where they deploy PMCs, particularly if they're being deployed to areas where they don't really know the local terrain or where they don't really have the training to deal with it. Like we saw in Mozambique, when the seven now Russian PMCs were beheaded by ISIS, they really weren't prepared for that kind of counterinsurgency operation. These are recruits that come from Belarus, Moldova, uh, uh, different part Russian regions. Some of them fight along foreigners like in Libya, Syrians and Sudanese who are just trying to escape poverty. These people don't have the training and the wherewithal to deal with this, and that's a serious problem. In their political interference operations suffer from similar things. I mean, they may be Nashi volunteers, like civil society members who might be able to drum out turnout in a local election in Russia, but if you put them in Madagascar, you'll find them, they're the cover getting blown, and you'll find themselves having a lot of difficulty. So they're gonna to have to be more judicious and more cautious about where they focus on, and also specialize. I mean, I think that Wagner Group is by far the dominant entity in terms of PMCs. Prigozhin acts as an agent of the Russian state, but he also has his own economic interests in Central African Republic and Sudan. He'll, he won't do anything necessarily to undermine Putin, but he won't always do conduct that furthers Russia's interests. So I think the Russians might divest and start looking at more specialized PMCs, or at least a variety of them to keep Prigozhin on his toes. So they might look at people like RSB to focus on landmine removal, more insecurity group to deal with mar uh, maritime security. His arch rival, Konstantin Malafiev, might be doing the political interference operations too. So they might get better quality and more value and also wean in some of the more autonomous and self-serving instincts of Prigozhin if they do that. So that's how I see the PMCs as a, as a challenge for, from the Russian point of view. Maybe one thing to add about that is, is in Russian decision-making. As, as I mentioned, there's obvious benefits to using PMCs, which is that you've got a bit of deniability from Moscow and you've got this 
optionality in terms of what they're actually doing once they're on the ground. Um, th there are also um, using PMC's poses. So one is, uh, do you actually control them? Uh, and the answer is kind of unclear. The, the track record suggests that on the one hand, there's definitely very close ties between Russian security services and the different PMCs, uh, especially the Wagner Group. Uh, on the other hand, it does look like there's been a number of instances where uh, there's been uh, miscommunication between state actors uh, in the Russian military in particular and PMCs that have, uh, in, in one particular case in Syria, caused the death of 100 PMCs. Um, so there's, there's, there's definitely uh, communication issues that at the very least are posed. There's also command and control issues. Um, if it's not obvious um, from at least open sources uh, um, what communication are between the Kremlin and PMC leaders and how often these lines of communication are used. For, in other words, is, is the Kremlin regularly calling Evgeny Prigozhin, the head of Wagner, and saying, do this and do that? Or is Prigozhin trying to guess what the Kremlin would like him to do? Um, probably a mix of both, but we're not really sure which way that command and control uh, system leans. Third, within the Russian system, there are people who uh, likely understand the utility of PMCs, but there are also people who feel like they might be losing out as a result of PMCs. PMCs, to a certain extent, displace existing security forces, uh, taking over some tasks that they might otherwise do. And the fact that PMCs are, on the one hand, providing a political security service, while on the other hand, uh, mining for diamonds on the side also risks creating jealousy of those security forces that wish they too had some diamond mining rights. So all of this, I think, suggests that the, the PMCs are not necessarily uh, as brilliant a tactic as they might often seem. They certainly have benefits, but they also have costs. And I'll add one final cost on top of it, which is that uh, from the perspective of the Russian state, uh, it's not obvious that you want uh, to, uh, to have more groups with separate command and control systems uh, reasonably heavily armed, getting military training. Uh, that's not generally a recipe uh, for political stability, either in terms of your foreign relations, but also at home. And it does seem like there are some risks to the ability of the Russian state to control its, its tools of violence if it continues to use uh, PMCs, uh, not only abroad in Africa, but also along Russia's border in places like Ukraine. Thank you. Uh, now I'd like to uh, turn it back to President Flynn, who will uh, moderate the questions from the audience. Uh, thank you all. all um, uh, great discussion and some really great questions from the audience. I'd like to remind them to uh, the audience so to put their questions in the q and A. I'm sort of having to. <laughs> we've got a bunch in the chat and a bunch in the Q and A, so it'll make life easier. Um, one of the first questions we got from Dan Whitman. He talks about during the Cold War, leaders like Denis Sassoon-Gueso sided with the USSR mainly for opportunistic reasons. Is this no longer the case? What are African leaders' motives now? So we've talked a lot about what the Russian motives might be, but we haven't talked a lot about the, the individual African states. And to answer another question, when we talk about Africa here, we're using the term loosely. We're using the entire continent, including the some. Uh, geopolitical folks put into the Middle East category, but we're talking about all of Africa. Um, and so, so what are the motives of the Africans? And as you know, during the Cold War, you could pretty much divide up the continent uh, between the Russia's client states and the U.S. client states, and there were a variety of both hard power and soft power reasons why African leaders would, would cooperate, including educational programs, all kinds of Africans uh, attended college in um, the USSR, uh, got their military training, uh, you know, uh, all that. Uh, is any of that happening today? And, and if so, or if not, what is motivating uh, these African nations to cooperate with the Russians? Yeah, the, I would like to start with that. That's a really interesting question. I would say that, uh, Unlike the Cold War, we have the bipolar environment in which you have some countries in the American sphere and some kind of Soviet sphere. There's really very few African countries that view Russia as the dominant or exclusive partner. They view Russia as one of many uh, hedge partners, Prince Chinese hegemony or dominance, maybe alongside France, alongside Turkey, alongside UAE, alongside regional powers in the Middle East. So Russia is seen as one partner in a collective. That's one distinction that I want to make from the Cold War. Uh, 
Uh, with regards to how Africans uh, see value, I think that there's a different motives and there's different goals at the elite level and at the popular level. And that's one of the chronic problems with Russian soft power projection in Africa is that the elites buy into a lot of these, even some of these Soviet historical narratives, these memory narratives, they're supportive of the Russian conduct in Syria. They view Russia as, a, as a, sometimes even a positive or constructive force in their rhetoric. But at the popular level, they're just seen as yet another colonial power. They're seen as extractive. They're seen as promoting disinformation and discord within society. That's a gap that's very hard to square. So when we're talking about African interests, we're really often talking about African elite interests. That's the second point I wanted to make. So now to look at how, why they're interested in Russia, there's several things they can get from Russia. First is they can get is a relatively easy access supply of, uh, of weaponry. And Russia is very flexible, of course, in terms of the countries that it might sell weaponry to. It doesn't, it's not beholden to human rights restrictions. It's not beholden to any kind of strings or conditionalities associated with uh, political interference or anything like that. So as soon as the multilateral sanctions were lifted on Eritrea, for example, who was the first country to sell them weapons? Russia was, right? In uh, so Sudan, I mean, 83% of the weapons that Bashir purchased in the last years in power came from Russia. So even very isolated regimes that are in the state sponsors of terrorism list in the United States or are seen as rogue, rogue regimes, Russia is willing to partner with them. They're crisis proof and they're seen as reliable. Secondly, Russia is a provider of military training, which is an inheritance from the Soviet era use of tactical advisors. As I said earlier, they have about 20 different uh, technical agreements with African countries, including mostly states in the Sahel that are suffering from insurgency. So countries like Burkina Faso, Niger, Mali, they may not be happy with French counterterrorism tactics. So Russia comes in and offers something as an alternative and they gravitate towards that, hoping to combine the, maybe the best of the French and the best of the Russian and get a more harmonious strategy. I think that Russia's successes in Syria further that dimension as well. And thirdly, just to briefly recap, I think that Russia acts as a reliable bulwark and defender of, uh, of countries uh, in the United Nations and multilateral institutions that are facing human rights abuses or, or potential risks of sanctions, like they did with Robert Mugabe in Zimbabwe. So that's, they're seen as a useful, great power partner in international fora who more reliably go out to bat for them than China or, for that matter, any other greater regional power. So those are the things that I think that the Africans get from Russia. Could I add to that, Raleigh, on the on the Cold War um, angle, which which one of the questioners um, brought up? I, mean, I, I think the Cold War is an interesting comparison point to the present for a number of reasons. Sam's absolutely right to note the difference that we're no longer in a bipolar system. It, it's even questionable whether we were then, but we're certainly not today. And uh, and Russia is far from what, being one of the dominant poles in the region. But I think the Cold War is also useful for some lessons that it can provide because if you look back to a lot of the um, the sort of proxy conflicts that the U.S. and the Soviet Union um, fought throughout Africa, either by arming different groups or uh, launching coups or providing uh, aid to uh, different leaders that would agree to, um, to, 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 to support them on international questions. In hindsight, a lot of that looks pretty extraneous to how the Cold War actually ended up. Um, which is to say that it's not obvious that if you hadn't had any competition in Africa over the course of the Cold War, the final result would have been any different. Um, and I think that holds lessons for the United States as it thinks about other great powers in Africa today, which is that if you try to focus great power competition in Africa, uh, you're probably mislearning uh, the lessons that the Cold War ought to teach, which is that, in fact, great power competition is decided uh, by other factors, not by uh, skirmishes in, in relatively low priority regions like Africa. And that's important, I think, because one of the, uh, the costs of the Cold War was a lot of additional conflict in Africa that didn't need to happen. It was a result of, of both American and Soviet policymakers thinking that it was worth their time to fight the Cold War in Africa, when in fact it was a second or third order concern and uh, only very loosely related to why the Soviet Union eventually collapsed. And so that's, I think, a, a lesson from the Cold War that it's worth us remembering today when we talk about great power competition in Africa to think about uh, what priority ought we to place on Africa when we think about great, comp great power competition. And maybe is it better to remove the frame of great power competition and let uh, our focus on Africa be dominated by African variables rather than Russian or Chinese variables?
Uh, that's that's really interesting, and it prompts a question for me too. Again, looking back at at the Cold War, comparing and contrasting, as I recall, a big push uh, of the diplomatic efforts were played out in the UN. It was basically who could capture the NG or the the General Assembly, the G, the UNGA, in important votes. And did that really matter? And does it matter today? Well, it's a, it's a fair question. Go, go ahead, Sam. Oh, you, you, okay, sorry, yeah. I think that that absolutely matters with regards to the uh, UNGA. I think that if you look at the uh, resolutions on Ukraine, you'll find that about 60% of African countries now chronically either abstain from resolutions condemning Russia or they kind of vote along with them. So Russia, through its reciprocal perceived uh, support as a crisis-proof partner, through its, uh, some of its development aid initiatives, the use of Ro Rosatom, the use of PMCs, and the fact that it's done so in such a diffuse manner all the way across the continent. 43 heads of states uh, came to Sochi in 2019. Each one of them was offered something that was a carrot. That's been uh, very useful. I think the Russians have been more effective than I think the Americans in some ways in terms of broadening and expanding their level of support within the UNGA. Uh, just as an aside, we can, we can look at Taiwan that way too. Uh, who has taken advantage of relationships in Taiwan to help them in international fora. Um, question on uh, how will the economic crisis caused by the tam pandemic and collapse in oil prices impact Russia's involvement in Africa? Will it push them deeper in the continent as they seek to get their hands on resources from which they could profit or will it force them to retreat? And um, sort of uh, paired with this on the pandemic regarding soft power, how powerful would you U.S. assistance with coronavirus vaccinations be, and I would add more economic uh, relief from the U.S. as well. Well, on, on the economic side, I think that one of the keys to Russia's engagement in Africa is that it's extraordinarily low cost to Russia. Uh, Russia is not deploying lots of personnel um, to Africa when it is, as, as we've mentioned, it's often cross-subsidized by business ventures that they're undertaking uh, while they're there uh, in, in different mining um, spheres. And so Russia's uh, really not at all um, deciding its Africa policy based on how much uh, money it has available. If uh, Russia, like all countries, faced a pretty severe crisis last year when coronavirus hit, in reality, um, there's, there's, there's no real cost pressure on, on Russia's presence in Africa simply because it makes up such a tiny share of Russia's overall um, foreign policy budget or even its government budget as a whole. So I, I actually wouldn't expect that much uh, change in Russia's Africa policy based on uh, any sort of economic pressure. Yeah, I would agree with that. I don't think that there's going to be that much of a change. I mean, I think that also it's important to keep in mind that Russia's current level of trade with Africa is extremely low. I mean, in 2019, it was only about $20 billion. That was less than one third what India had as this volume of trade. And India is not, not really discussed very often as a major player on the continent. And Putin has got very ambitious trade targets that are coming through from Africa. In 2019, he said he wanted to double trade by 2024. And that may not be wholly realistic because their trade is largely concentrated in a few sectors. Defense is concentrated in civilian nuclear energy. It's concentrated in mining, those three main areas. The Russian railways have started to, to enter and they're trying to leverage their role as a wheat supplier to potentially contribute towards the supply of agricultural and irrigation technology. That could be another frontier of development. But because their, co their core costs are maintained, I think the only way in which they could uh, go is up. And the question is whether the pandemic slows down or delays those trade uh, targets or the diversification beyond their core extractives and defense uh, uh, deals is also unclear. And also, I think the pandemic, if it has a prolonged economic impact, it could restrict and derail the scope of some of Rosatom's ambitions too. Because the South African Rosatom project one of the reasons why it was ultimately canceled because its long-term cost over 50 or 60 years was estimated as high as $400 billion. They managed to get the Al-Daba project in Egypt, which is another multi-billion dollar project, which is great. But elsewhere on the continent, like some of the other target countries that they're looking at, like Ethiopia or Rwanda, they might find that unaffordable and they're already starting to question the long-term economic benefits or whether it's just really facilitating kleptocracy and benefiting a small number of elites who are having preferential access to those contracts. And I think that coming out of it, just one last thing, I think that China, Turkey, um, and uh, 
other countries have been more effective in terms of supplying COVID-19 relief and aid towards African countries that will kind of win them concessions and win them better deals at the end. Russia has had a history, unfortunately, of promising aid than not delivering it. Even to Ethiopia, they had that high-level chat with Abiy Ahmed. In April, Russia was so supportive of his debt relief initiative. And then in July, the Ethiopian embassy sent a, sent a statement asking, oh, we hope to receive the aid that we were promised in April soon. That's a small example that Russia is not really being seen as a crisis-proof partner in the economic sphere or in the humanitarian aid sphere like it is in the security sphere or in the United Nations. And that gap and that dissonance could limit long Russian economic potential in Africa. Uh, we've talked a lot about uh, Russian PMCs in Africa, but there's, there's a question uh, referring to the agreement signed last year between Russia, Sudan, and the Central African Republic for military bases in those countries uh, to be used partly to enable the deployment of Russian PMCs throughout Africa as sort of a rapid, rapid reaction force. Um, what do you think about that? And, and there's a note that Russia is allowed to send materiel to Sudan, but that Sudanese aren't allowed to inspect. So any comments on this? Sam, I know you just finished an article on this topic. Do you want to? Yeah, it? for sure. Yeah, I'd like to talk about this. So uh, I think in Sudan, I mean, the uh, Russian base uh, deployment was something that was a long time coming because the Russians have wanted a facility or a base on the Red Sea really since 2008. So they uh, got a temporary deal to potentially get a long-term base in Benghazi in the Mediterranean after meeting with Gaddafi, and they already were looking at Aden as a potential location. And then, of course, the Yemeni civil war prevented Yemen from being a potential uh, starting point for Russian base deployments. So they looked into Eritrea, they looked at Djibouti, the Americans strong-armed the, the Russians out of Djibouti after the Ukraine crisis. So they had to settle on Sudan, even though some Russian defense experts felt that Port Sudan wasn't necessarily infrastructurally the best, uh, the best location, they've resigned themselves to it. I think that that base is going to be used more for broader power projection on the Red Sea, contributions to anti-piracy, contributions to uh, counterterrorism and maritime security threats. It'll burnish their, their ability to contribute to Indian Ocean security. But within Sudan, I don't think it will lead to a larger deployment of military forces that would lead to that them to basically being the glue that kind of keeps the Sudanese state together and uh, prevents internal conflicts from boiling over. Russia doesn't want that kind of commitment. And after the June 3rd massacre, where the Russian PMCs were involved in perhaps directing the rapid security forces to kill more than 120 people in Khartoum, the Sudanese public and the Sudanese civilian government doesn't really want Russia there either. It, all, it felt like it was just the Sudanese military that wanted Russia there and the civilians didn't want it. So. I think this, uh, Russia's base is more about that, those broader ambitions in, Indi in the Indian Ocean and the Red Sea. In Central African Republic, it may be a slightly different scenario. Tuadera asked the Russians for the establishment of a base in October 2019 during the Sochi summit, and the Russians vehemently denied that they were even considering it. But there's been persistent rumors ever since that it might, might occur. The uh, Russians might establish a base there because they want to secure preferential access to Central African Republic's di diamond industry. Lobe Invest, obviously, is heavily uh, present there, and that's a close ally of Prigozhin. And they might see that as a way of getting access to the resources, especially because the French have withdrawn militarily in Central African Republic for about four years, and the Americans are nowhere to be seen. This could be a good way of consolidating their influence in the long term. I think that they were, Russians were hedging in Central African Republic between Tuadera, the president, and armed groups. But over the past year, they seem to have really doubled their, down their support for Tuadera. You may have seen those 300 troops that came in alongside Rwandan peacekeepers before the elections in CAR last month. And now that Tuadera has been reelected and his hold on power, however tenuous, seems to be at least institutionally secure, we might see a Russian base develop in CAR sometime within the next uh, three to four years. Fascinating. Uh, Chris, anything to add to that? No, I think Sam covered it all. Yeah. Uh, one topic that, that we haven't talked about, uh, at, which I think is really important uh, concerning Africa, is climate change. Uh, as you're aware, uh, Af Africa within the, that continent, one of the largest rainforests uh, still uh, existing in the world, as well as they've fought anti-desertification uh, for years, for decades. Um, 
Russia and China both are not famous for being, uh, you know, climate conscious in what they do. Uh, can you comment on that? and um, whether what the impact of this is on um, on the continent itself? If and if you know, do the Africans care? And is this an area of potential advantage for the United States? Well, I think it's a, a tricky issue for the United States because. Uh, on the, on the international stage, the U.S. has long been seen as, as sort of in the Russian and Chinese camp as not the most climate conscious. Now, that may uh, change with the new administration, but certainly that's, that's been the case over the past couple of years. Um, I think there's a, a challenge in, in climate diplomacy in general, which is uh, that the costs of climate change happen over a long time frame, um, and the, the beginning had happened relatively soon or, or even today, and that's that uh, slows individual countries' efforts to deal with climate change, but it also has implications for diplomacy focused on the issue. Um, because if you're a, a leader of a country and, and, uh, and a, a power comes to you and says, we're going to help deal with climate change, that might give you benefits over a 10 or 20 year time horizon, but you're probably looking to win your next election or stave off your opponents today. And so I think the result of that is outside of specific cases, it's, it's hard to win that many friends um, by promising um, to focus on climate per se. Now, there might be mitigation efforts that uh, would be economically useful, um, but we certainly haven't seen climate play a, a major role in um, how African countries interact with, with Russia or, or China or the U.S. for that matter. I'd add as well that on the Russian perspective, there's a very interesting debate underway about whether climate change is a good thing or a bad thing for Russia. Uh, and there's a, a, a pretty prominent view within Russia that actually, because Russia is far to the north, uh, a bit of uh, warming wouldn't be a, a bad thing for Russia. It would uh, melt Arctic ice caps and facilitate um, navigation in the Arctic Sea, which could reduce the shipping time from Asia to Europe and, and therefore potentially uh, transition shipping uh, through, uh, through Russian um, territorial waters. And so as a result, uh, Russia, in many cases, and there's debate about this in the Russian uh, elite, but Russia often makes the argument that climate change isn't necessarily all that bad. Uh, and, and I think that probably affects its, its climate diplomacy as well. It's certainly not at the forefront of countries trying to get multinational agreement on climate. Uh, and it, it, in some ways, it, it's able to take the opposite view that in certain cases for certain countries, um, Russia will argue that climate change might not be a bad thing. Yeah, yeah I absolutely agree with Chris. I think his points were great. I think uh, that Russia really hasn't engaged with the African countries much on climate change. I mean, when Russia talking about being a country that's uh, trying to confront it. It always seems to be talking about that in multilateral forms or at a global level, try to show that it's contributing constructively to the world order. It's not really something that they've gotten to the granularities at a regional or local. And one thing I would have to add too is that African advocates for climate change, NGOs and groups that are pro-environmental generally tend to be very anti-Russian and very of Russia. And they've been at the forefront of lobbying against them because of Rosatom's uh, and you notice that there were a lot of environmental lobbyist groups that pushed back against Rosenbaum's deal with South African uh, uh, President Jacob Zuma after 2014. And I think that that will continue. That Russia's continued to see as a country that's opposed to environmentally friendly measures in Africa rather than a constructive player on the continent. Um, another topic we haven't really talked about is uh, corruption. And corruption, as you know, is a huge problem in Africa. And we have a question about does Russia, is there any sort of modeling that Russia does, even only inadvertently, as a kleptocracy for African nations? And, um, and uh, you know, we've talked about the kleptocracy and Russia's near abroad. Well, maybe this is their far abroad and they see Africans as sort of fellow travelers in this area. Um, can you comment on uh, the impact of corruption on that relationship uh, and perhaps even with the Chinese as well as how, how does that affect U.S. interests? Because we, we in the U.S. have laws against corruption. Well, I think this is a huge issue and it's actually one where uh, U.S. legislation is in the process of, of being changed right now in a pretty meaningful way. Um, you know, I think you're absolutely right, Raleigh, to flag that action facilitates um, Russian influence in many ways because uh, Russia is able and willing to uh, use uh, under the table business dealings for political influence. Um, but one of the key things that I think is often underplayed in, in, in discussions of corruption is the extent to which 
a lot of corruption uh, is laundered through Western banks or via shell companies that are based in the West. And so we actually have a lot of leverage over this if we want to take action. Um, it, it's, it's London, it's New York, it's Swiss banks that are, are part of the problem. And to the extent that we're able to clean up our own financial systems, uh, it can actually have a really powerful effect on the ability of people in other countries to actually engage in corrupt activity because they simply can't access the financial systems. And so just uh, a couple of weeks ago, Congress passed legislation that would uh, require, uh, it would ban the um, anonymous ownership of, of shell companies, which is hugely important because that was something that um, a variety of, of, of foreigners were able to use to um, anonymously uh, move money into the U.S. And uh, often that was from um, money that was gained from corrupt transactions. There's a lot more we can do on this front. And I think it's actually interesting because it's a domestic legislative change that would actually have profound foreign policy ramifications. Uh, and I think this is actually a, an exciting area because it's one place where there's a fair amount of bipartisan agreement in Congress that we need to do more to fight corruption that's routed through our financial system and routed through our legal system, even if it's, uh, even if it's uh, foreign entities these are individuals who are actually uh, engaging in corrupt activities. Yeah, Sam, anything to add? Yeah, I mean, I think that Chris's points were excellent. I think that the one thing that's important to note is that some of the uh, kleptocratic uh, policies that come from the Russian state tend to uh, diffuse into Africa because really Russian investment in Africa is not really done by privately, but it's really being done heavily by spearheaded by state-owned companies, like whether it be Rostec in the defense sphere, Rosa Bourne Export, um, but Rosatom, uh, Nordgold, uh, like a Rosneft, Gazprom, all these companies are involved there. And there's certainly been uh, elements in which uh, the Russians have used their, uh, their, 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 their political position to gain uh, preferential access to uh, national resources. I mean, that, that one example would be Guinea's bauxite sector, where Nordgold was seen as getting one third of the concessions because of the fact that they were propping up Alpha Conde. And a lot of that money was being transferred informally and into the hands of a small number of Russian elites. So Russians kind of fuel kleptocracy in Africa and also create their own kleptocratic networks where they have a diplomatic or a military presence. That's what the lesson from Guinea showed. Libya, I think, is another front line in where Russian money laundering and Russian uh, kleptocracy is really taking center stage because a key element of Khalifa Haftar's uh, economic sustainability has come from the creation of a parallel center central bank where the Russians are printing dinars and printing banknotes and pumping those into the LNA's coffers. And that's making it a lot more difficult to sanction, to impose uh, UN sanctions on Haftar's uh, resources and is also allowing Haftar to purchase arms from Russia and to purchase arms from and, 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 and higher technical support from other countries. The Wagner Group, for example, is funded mainly by Emirati and Saudi sources, but a senior GNA official informed me too that there's a substantial Libyan consortium that also funds Russian military activities there. And that's being done through uh, this great, these great zone financial transfers. And that's something that no sanctions against Prigozhin will be able to counter. So there's uh, a lot of uh, uh, moving parts uh, that are partially due to Russia's own state of kleptocracy, as well as Russia's ability to capitalize and exacerbate the kleptocratic environments in local settings like Guinea and Libya. Thank you. This has been a fascinating discussion and unfortunately our time has come to an end and there are so, so many questions that are unanswered and areas that I think we could have an encore discussion, things you touched on. For instance, what are the French doing now in Africa these days? Uh, some of the former really big players on the continent, but we'll have to have you back for a subsequent discussion on that. Um, I'd like very much to thank our panelists, Chris and Sam and Ambassador Ray for a fascinating discussion today. Um, we encourage you to fill out the feedback form um, so that, uh, we, uh, that you will receive automatically as, as part of even registering for this. Um, and uh, thank again our sponsors uh, of FPRI. We're, we're truly grateful and we wish you all a safe and a good day. Take care. <laughs>